Hey everyone, I'm Jeff Gibber, the president and chief strategist of True Voice Media. I'm also the host of Conversations, the True Voice Media podcast where I bring on fascinating people from all walks of life and pick their brains about social media, entrepreneurialism, success, and so much more. For around the next 30 minutes, I get to have a really interesting conversation. You should stick around and listen in. So without further delay, let's get started. This is episode 35 of Conversations. 35. I'm 35. It's episode 35. I'm going to call this one my podcast equinox. And for my podcast equinox, I have Miley on the show. Miley, thank you for being on Conversations. Please introduce yourself to everybody that's listening. Well, thank you, Jeff. And it's a pleasure to be on the podcast Equinox with you. Um, So I really am a champion of people, and that's what I do. So I bring my passion and my power, my curiosity, my problem-solving skills, and I work with organizations and leaders to really up their game about how to be more effective with people um, and systems and drive business results. So I love that you said that you're a champion of people because I can. it's like almost like a play on words because you're a champion for people, but you are also a champion of people. You are a cha- – you know what I mean? Like, a, like you are yes. on the podium. Um, so for those <laughs> listening, um, it, you know, if you've listened to this show before and you've gotten to um, – listen to the different episodes, you know that we bring people in from all walks of life. You know, even though we're a social business agency, we bring people in from all different conversations. And Miley is someone who I met at, um, we met at the Michael Port um, Heroic Public Speaking, and you were one of the people on stage. You were the first to go up on stage. And within seconds of being up, I was like, I need to talk to this woman. And oh my God, (laughs) she is just simply adorable. So, um, you know, I I was lucky enough to be able to run into you in the, um, in the stairs well and your talk was so fascinating it was interesting because uh it was really exemplary of the work that michael port does with people in in their speaking where really he took like it was like five minutes of your opening and like just worked on that and made it so dramatic and interesting but it really stuck out because your whole um your whole talk was really about this idea of curiosity in leadership and i remember very explicitly you saying intrepid explorers and it just stuck out so much what is it that exactly that you do and that how does curiosity play into your work let's start there and let's let's kind of run with that perfect so curiosity i think is such it's like a superpower I mean, let's face it. You are pushing my buttons right now. I know. Uh, It's like this unassuming, you know, little cardigan cloaked entity, curiosity, kind of like little Albert Einstein. And, um, you know, when you activate curiosity, it's kind of like that unassuming library and the super librarian. But when you tap into that, you can really get to wonder and awe, which is, I mean, think about it. The things that really just make us go, wow. How does that happen? How does that occur? So for me, curiosity is one of those things that I've really been exploring deeply over the last four years. But let's face it, curiosity has been walking with me my whole life. Um, I like to know how things work. I want to know how people connect. How can you make things better? And so really over the last four years, I've been thinking more as I stepped away from an internal corporate role of how can curiosity help people move on that continuum from being closed and sure they're right about everything to really moving to the other end of the spectrum and being willing to explore, to play, to be open, to learn. And really that's where innovation happens. I think it's where vulnerability can show up. And that's where we can really make really strong people connections. And I think when we engage people's hearts and minds, that's really when you can get really great business results. And I think as we, you and I have talked too about, you know, technology and how technology is changing that. So as you talk about me being a champion of people, I'm making friends with the robots, (laughs) making friends with the machines and really wanting to understand that and think about how does that play in with how we lead and how we work. And so curiosity is all around all of those questions and thoughts. Okay, so I yeah. love I love any time that I have a guest on here 
and something is said that just makes like fireworks go off in my brain and you are just consistently that person. You know, this podcast is really born out of curiosity. What I love about doing this show is just talking with people that do all different things and things are said and then I think of an idea or a question or something that I have to ask. It's burning in me. So I love that actually I'm having you on to talk about curiosity, among other things, <laughs> on a show that is based entirely around curiosity. But the you know, what's interesting is you brought up so many different points in that. You know, the first thing is is that when I think about my role and you know a lot of consultants what our role is is it's not to come in and have answers but it's instead to come in and ask the right questions and those questions then lead to the answers that generally are innovative solutions to problems that people are facing and it's this i think it's the curiosity that allows us to ask those questions because honestly it's it's generally something we may not know a lot about or it's it's having those fresh eyes so we're able to go in and do that and and some consultants are going to be better than others where I want to kind of poke at what you're talking about and hear what you think about it is this. Why aren't we all curious? Why aren't we all approaching the work that we do with the lens of creativity and curiosity? Where does curiosity go to die? How does it happen? Yes, well, I've given that a lot of thought. And so when you think about how, I mean, Let's face it, we're born curious. I mean, as a child, imagine a baby. Think about a baby interacting with the surroundings. They're they're watching, they're looking, they try to taste everything, including mud, you know. (laughs) (laughs) That goes in their mouth, they're trying to process it. So, and then we have that little toddler that comes around. And what's the toddler's favorite three-letter question? Why? 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 (laughs) And... You know, I really believe that how we respond to those numerous whys help determine how curious, uh, how we're able to hold on to our curiosity through life. Because when we get to school, that can get shut down as well. So there's a there was a story that I read really long time ago. So I started off my my uh, my professional career as a secondary um, teacher, and so I was reading along the way, you know, interested in how people learn and kids learn. And there was a story by Leo Bascalia, who's a, you know, was a scholar about love. And he you know, created this class for people to talk about love. And they were talking about this little boy. And this little boy had gone to school and the teacher said, draw a tree. And this little boy took out, you know, the magenta and the cornflower and all the different crayons. And his tree was multicolored and it was crazy looking and it was wild. And, you know, what do you think the response was to that? That's not a tree. No, a tree is a green ball with a brown trunk. Yeah, it's (laughs) got green leaves and it's got a brown trunk. And yeah, we've all seen trees. Kid, come on. What are you thinking about? Right. And it's like we want to ship off the creative one who has lived, crawled, fallen out of a tree (laughs) to be like, no, we need you to conform. And so we slowly chisel away at that or different views of the world. And in part, it's how you think about our Industrial Revolution and, you know, the the work that came with that and kind of being able to produce widgets. Well, widgets have to be alike in order to be good widgets. So... That's why trees are one <laughs> one look. That's yeah. a widget. And so our schools are still around a lot of ways around, you know, how do people do production type work? It's kind of like, here's the machine. So it's almost like we tried to create, make humans into machines. Well, then they lose their curiosity. Um, and so somewhere along the way, you know, how do you keep, kids engaged in learning and so you'll see people experimenting with you know kids setting their own curriculum okay you need to learn this concept but how do you want to do but you know so do you want the the prescribed route and you have to hit these mile markers and it's this way or do you want to see what magic could possibly happen if you give somebody a box of something and you say figure it out you know and see what they can do with it. And I think we have a lot of culture here around not wanting to fail. And I think 
that curiosity can sometimes get wiped out in that space of wanting and failure because curiosity is really about playing and it's about experimenting. And when you can get more to that space of, I don't know what's going to happen, but let's see. And it's kind of, it's cool. Um, I saw something about a week or so ago. It was some, how scientists, when they discover something, it's not the, whoa, eureka moment. It's the, when they stop and they say, hmm, that's interesting. I didn't expect that to happen. And that to me is when curiosity comes in, when something unexpected happens. But if, like you said, if we're not engaged, if we're not tuned in, if we're not noticing, we miss it. We miss the the possibility of that magic. So, so much of this. (laughs) Okay, so. (laughs) <laughs> Sorry, I had to close something on my computer for a second, um, and you froze up for a second. But I, I wanted to touch on, so again, so many things. So it's so funny because I wrote down a note here. The note that I wrote down literally as you were saying that you got your start in education was the yeah. connection between leadership curiosity and education and how it must start at such an earlier age. And then I started writing notes about the changing nature of education from the industrial revolution to the knowledge age. And then you approach that. (laughs) So are you looking at my notes as number one, number two, you work with leaders. That's what you do. And you're helping them to rediscover curiosity and use that in their leadership style to be able to, um, to be able to be more innovative, to be able to better communicate and empower their their staff and all that sort of good stuff. So what 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 is it that you find stops that? What I guess here's the the question is because what you alluded to is that we kill the creativity by creating widgets that are standardized. We create systems. We create processes to create consistency. And consistency, I think, is something that feels good and comfortable to human beings because there's a certain predictability. So is it is that what stops us from being curious in leadership roles is that the predictability and the standardization is what allows us to scale, but it's really those massive leaps that come from curiosity. What have you found is stopping leaders from just naturally being curious if that's maybe what got them there in the first place? Yeah, and sometimes I don't know that curiosity is what got them there. I mean, a lot of times what I've observed in in again, depending on your systems and your recruiting promotion processes and companies, people oftentimes are promoted because they were a technical expert at something or they were the best at whatever. And then it's like, wow, the next step for you is to become a leader. And the person goes, oh, okay, that's the next logical move for me. I should become a leader. And I've talked to lots of leaders who, you know, well, I guess they weren't really leaders. They they came back and they said, Miley, I don't even like people anymore. <laughs> like, I don't know that you did to begin with, but you thought you needed to move to this. So I don't know that we do a great job of really testing out, do people know what it really means to become a leader of people? And what does that entail? And that it's okay to make a choice to stay in a technical space or customer service space and to not say, I want to be, I want the top job. I want to not, I want to work, get my work done through people rather than necessarily doing the work directly myself. Um, so to your question about curiosity and leaders, I think what happens is we get used to, you know, being the best at whatever. And then we move into this leadership role. And if we have some wherewithal, some emotional intelligence, throw in the side of social intelligence and dogged determination not to fail. Um, We figure out what we need to, to keep the boat afloat. And then what happens is, and I see this over and over again, I'll ask a client, you know, coaching client, I'll say, when is the last time you did something new? When's the last time that you were a beginner? And a lot of times I'll get the deer in the headlight look, <laughs> the <"Whoa." laughs> uh, because why we get uncomfortable with being a beginner because we get so used to that feeling of we're the expert, we're the one that people come to, and so we're not really testing the limits of our knowledge um, because again that's that 
taking risks, playing outside of that, depending on the cultural culture of the organization, that might not feel safe. It it's might a very not be vulnerable impressed. feeling, I'd imagine, for a leader to kind of expose their belly like that and say, I don't know, or I, I, I'm i taking something on that I that I may fail at, and other people might laugh at me or whatever, and, and or, or judge me that I'm not capable in this area. Yeah, and so that's part of, you know, it's the kid with the magenta tree. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, hmm, that's kind of different. Well, put that in the corporate world, it's also still the same reaction, it's just different. It's in a different pool, and the stakes are higher because your income is paying your, for your family or for your wherewithal, all of those things. So I had someone share a story with me, another coach um, share a story with me that she had a client who um, thought that he knew to a T his people. Like he said, I know exactly who the best person on my team is at this. I know the best person at this. I know. And these people, they're just really not contributing a lot. And so the challenge to him was for him to ask more open-ended questions of his team. He didn't use open-ended questions. And open-ended questions and curiosity, they just go together. Closed-ended questions go with the, I am sure I am right about everything, and I'm not interested in learning anything more. Damn it. Well, I just have yes-no questions for the rest of this. (laughs) Dang. Um, Yes, yes, no, yes. And (laughs) good night, folks. uh, (laughs) um, But so this leader actually tried this experiment for 30 days to not predict, but to be curious, to just be open, and to really practice with this. And what he found, what he discovered was that he didn't have his people pegged correctly. He had some people who were really good at managing up and putting on the right picture of this is what I'm doing and I'm successful. And it was the people who were probably a little somewhat more introverted and weren't tooting their own horn were actually the people that were the ones getting the work done. Um, and had a deeper understanding of what needed to happen. And so I think that, you know, we're, as humans, I mean, our, our brains are supercomputers. And when we ignite curiosity, it's that attraction, that interest, that openness. We can learn a lot. And so it's the same with, though, even though it's a supercomputer, And our brains can process a lot of things. Like you and I can look at each other because we're, we might be seeing each other face to face. We start to sync up and mirror each other without even knowing that we're doing it because our bodies are conditioned to that. Our brains are conditioned to that. And so there's a lot of things that happen below the surface, but how much we can actually put in that conscious mind is a lot smaller So we have these great coping mechanisms that are coping mechanisms, but they can get in our way. And those are things like you will hear models called like the ladder of inference. So there's all this data around me. I'm in a room of 60 people. Well, I can't pick up everybody's facial expressions. My brain is scanning. My face, my eyes are scanning. Um, But what I do then to try to make sense of it and to go really fast is I try to use the filters and my life experience to impose on that situation to make sense of it to move forward more rapidly. It's like shortcuts, (laughs) mental shortcuts to read the scenario. Absolutely. And so we've got that going on. And so if we are curious and we challenge ourselves on those assumptions, we can discover something different oftentimes. But most of the time, what happens in organizations we're, we're, we're trying to produce faster widgets. <laughs> we're trying to, ooh, we have less people, but let's have more results. And so it requires us to slow down slightly in order to challenge those assumptions, to really look at something differently, and then order to probably do something in a different, more effective way that could allow us to be even faster. But that step back feels counterintuitive. It feels counter to the speed of the organization, especially if it's a big one and they're moving fast. It's really hard to go, can we step back for a minute? Mm -hmm. 
you know. So you just called the brain a supercomputer. And I while I have another question that I am dying to ask you, I'm going to ask you after we go down this path because I am so curious what you think about this. We're going into machine land. We're going into the technology world for uh, for this piece of the conversation because – I know you know a little something, something about it, and I'm curious what you think. So the human brain, yeah, it's a supercomputer. It's taking in millions of signals at all times and con- interpreting them and using past experience, et cetera. But it is, as much as it is a computer, it also is dictated by emotions and feelings and various different things. And curiosity is a particularly human condition. It's it's a process by which only we can really do that. Now, at the same time, we're building these machines that are trying to replicate humans, and we're building machines that are trying to be standardized and perform simple functions and jobs, but we're also trying to teach them to think about scenarios and read the the terrain, you know, self-driving cars, to make better decisions. Do you think we're going to be able to codify creativity and curiosity? Or is that something that would be really the magical gap before we get to true AI? Is this something that we can even get to, you think? Wow. Have you been able to to break down <laughs> curiosity into like a process? And if so, does that defeat curiosity? Is curiosity innately unable to be codified? That's a, it's a, that's a fascinating question and premise that you put forth. Um, and I know I, I won't be sleeping tonight because I'll be thinking <laughs> Good luck with um, that. Good night, everyone. <laughs> Miley's going to be up for the next way. week. Uh-oh. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, so one of the projects that I'm working on is, is consulting with a company that is really um, – built this platform that's really about taking the social network within an organization and making the invisible visible. Yes, I did say that right. Um, And so that is, so that's like at the very beginning is just a platform. And then the machine learning part comes in, which I know you know far more about this than I do, but for your listeners, and they probably know more too, is that you start to train the machine to be smarter. And so on this this platform that I'm working with, the the name of the platform is Owen. Sounds like somebody want to like pull up and have a cup of tea with. I would totally Um, have tea with Owen. (laughs) You know, you want to make it un- Unthreatening, because one of the studies, I don't know if you saw this study, I'm not sure whose it was, it was in the last few weeks, it was about the number one, one of the number one fears of Americans is technology, Um, and kind of that threat of being replaced by a machine, and, you know, that's been happening for a long time. But back to your question about curiosity, and can you codify it? You know, one of the things I said to Tej Mehta, who's the CEO and the social engineer of this 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 platform, is I said, you know, I really want Owen to be curious. I want Owen to ask open-ended questions. So when Owen is delivering back data or results, that Owen is never giving a yes, no, closed question for someone to do, but asking open-ended questions or providing an open-ended list of questions so that the human, (laughs) who is then taking it and going, okay, now what's next? Because Owen isn't at a level of being able to give suggestions on what's next. Owen is still very much in the toddler, infant toddler stage of learning. Um, and so my brain is probably part of what is going to train Owen to be curious and to be a feminist. Um, <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Just FYI. Um, it's my, 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 uh, my underhanded scheme there. My robots um, would be foodies. They would be like, yes, I have go. answered your question, but you should probably also go to this place for a chimichanga. <laughs> There you go. With some sriracha sauce, oh, right? God, we we are kindred spirits <laughs> on everything. Uh, well, let me let me. I want to just yeah. stop you for a second and ask you this though, because you said something and it triggered for me this thought. You're saying we're programming these machines and we're programming them to ask open ended questions, but open ended questions are not necessarily curiosity. 
I think, and correct me if I'm right. wrong, isn't curiosity a byproduct of actually not just the the process of asking the question, but actually caring about what's happening? Yes. So I, I think curiosity there yes. there may be an additional level, right? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Because when I I find when I'm curious, it's not just like I want to advance the conversation or I'm trying to get to the next piece. It's more that like I for myself am interested in what's happening, and and interest is uh, an emotional response to something. And I think on the other side, the the act of asking the question and, and how the person answers, the answer itself would have to be less than you're checking boxes or filling in. Uh, text things, but more that you feel like you're having a dialogue where you're bettering the other person or opening their mind or whatever. Yeah. And so you're absolutely right. And so the, I mean, when we activate curiosity in ourselves, I mean, three different parts of our brain light up, which tells us that we have more than one thing happening. Um, <laughs> You know, so, I mean, it's like Christmas tree inside there when curiosity goes off. It's, it is a firecracker. Um, you know, so I, I think it's really interesting and I, I will, will be, thank you for the, the great thinking and, and around this because it will help me go back and, and continue to think about and shape that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, you know, I had shared with you probably a couple weeks ago that I was reading this book, and I'm going to get the title wrong, so I'm going to just quick bring it up here so I um, tell you the right title. So, um, so, and of course it's not working. Um, oh, here it is. So it's by Jeff Colvin, and it is... Humans are underrated what high achievers need to know that brilliant machines never will. Um, And I'm still not all the way through it, but one of the things that I think is fascinating is that even when machines, robots, can do things better, faster than humans, there are still things that we as humans are predisposed to prefer. So... Two of the examples within what they write about is, um, you know, judge and jury. Well, technically the laws and looking at case law and what's happened and the what's, you know, all of those things, you could actually probably have a more consistent outcome for sentencing for all of those things running it through a computer. Yeah, and probably a less prejudicial one. Right. And, but as humans, what the studies have shown is that people are, are not on board with that. Even if even if you could tell me that if my judgment's going to come back right before lunch, it's probably going to be less positive for me because <laughs> everyone just wants to get to lunch, you know. And there's different times of the day. I mean, there's all this data that they can run through and show. And at the end of the day, we're not really so much, it's not necessarily logical, but we would rather have a human making the decision or making the sentence. Same as we prefer a doctor to be the one telling us about our medical results. We want a human um, to, you know, if we're getting um, a diagnosis. Is that a of distrust that of, the, of the newness and the change, do you think? Or is that a situation where it's really just more, uh, I, I guess, an innate desire to have our our destinies or or results of things by our peers rather than algorithms is a good question. I don't know that anyone has the complete answer to that. I think that you know, I, I curiosity is about connecting. You know, it's that engaging with the concept of something or an idea or a person. Um, and to me, I think that human connection piece is one of the differentiators of what we do. We're also in danger of losing that. So I think that that wanting a person, a doctor, to be the one that shares with us, here's what your, here's what the diagnosis is, here's what your prognosis is. Um, we want a human connection. We hunger for that connection. Um, and, you know, I think that... Um, you know, there was a study that was done that was elementary kids, you know, that have been, you know, using phones and texting a lot. What they found was that their ability to read, like, intuitively someone's facial expressions and understand what 
that was telling them had was not very well advanced. And so they took them to a camp for one or two weeks and, you know, no tech. <laughs> and, you know, immediately that face-to-face connection, we build our skills back pretty quickly. I mean, you think about where we as humans evolved from before the industrial age, way, way back on the savanna. I mean, we survived because we had communities and you had to be able to read who was on your side, who was against you, who was going to throw you to the saber tooth, you know, all of those things. And as we continue to, you know, and for me, it's not like a dire thing. It's something I think we really need to talk about and think about, which is we always, we feel like we're more connected than ever with the electronic technology. And yet we're less connected in other ways. And part of that's even how we choose to live. We tend to live pretty isolated much more so than the time frames where we had extended family living in households or, you know, we had neighbors living in apartment buildings and you chose to live there because you came from another country and you settled together. Um, so I think that there is an innate longing in all of us to belong, to be seen, to be heard, to be understood. And that shows up in my work all the time. Um, And I think that that's part of why I think technology can sometimes feel like a threat to that. Um, And yet, that being said, it also opens up connection for people. Mm -hmm. So if somebody's in Antarctica and you're stuck with a bunch of penguins, you can still communicate with the rest of the world. That's pretty amazing. But it's not quite the same. And we Mm -hmm. don't know all the ramifications of that. We do know, to some extent, that our brains are changing because of the technology connectivity that we're utilizing that's different than, you know, um, my older brain to your brain. Even though we're kindred spirits, your brain probably is showing up in some very different ways than mine. Maybe some. Just based on kind of what we're exposed to. Maybe some. I I think... (laughs) <laughs> I like to think myself a bridge generation. I think I understand the millennial mindset and how they're developing. And I also think about, you know, my parents and, and you know, every kind of age group. And, um, you know, I grew up with Prodigy. I still remember what the modem sound like and how pissed I was when somebody would pick up the phone. So I am still, you know, in the generation where I remember the time before and I, I now have grown up with and, and use these tools extensively. And I think, you know, I've read some studies about, um, you know, how um, – the brains of teenagers and kids are changing with the use of all these devices. And it's interesting because, you know, I say bridge generation because I kind of translate between the two generations really, because I see a lot of people older than me look at the millennials and younger and say, oh, well, they're just, you know, they're stupid. They're always on their phone and they don't know how to have face-to-face connections. And it's like, yeah, maybe some of those skills have um, weakened a bit, but their ability to maintain more relationships than we ever have been able to has expanded beyond the capacity of my parents or anything like that. So right. that change is definitely a thing. And, and for me, I, um, I, I tend to use all these tools to have more lunch and breakfast and happy hours than other people. But that's just a, that's a conversation for another time. <laughs> I want to ask you a couple things, though, about these individuals who you know, kind of a little bit going back to the codifying curiosity, because I run into this issue a lot of the times where, you know, I'm in, I'm in the business of helping companies strategize how to use social media. And as a part of that, there are all of these sort of rules and I guess best practices and advice that have come out of social, be authentic, be connected, be human, be honest, all these different things. And what I wind up having is these really fascinating conversations where people say, well, how do I be authentic? And the the question itself almost makes your head spin. And I'd imagine in your case, you're probably dealing with people who will say, well, how do I be curious? How And and they're looking for literally a checklist of like, if I were to go through these steps, would I appear curious and be able to achieve my outcome? How do you – because I feel like it's less about giving them a, a checklist and it's more about igniting something in them. And how do you do that? Right. That's an excellent question. I've not ever tried to explain that before. You know, for me, there's the one of the important things is that every leader needs to be, they need to activate their superpowers, you know? And so while I believe firmly that because we all were born curious, we have the ability to access curiosity, um, whereas, um, you know, maybe we never had to work really hard for something, so we really don't know how to be intrepid. Um, you know, 
I love that you just pulled out Intrepid. I love it. Yeah, you know. Do the scarf thing for me. Do the scarf thing. Come on. Yeah, there we go. So awesome. for those that um, are just listening, you can't see it, but but Miley just <laughs> swung her scarf like an intrepid explorer over her shoulder, and it's it's fantastic. It's very well rehearsed, nicely done. I, I practiced it in New York, so you it's did. well. No. It's very good. Um, so for me, it's really helping people remember what it was like to be curious, and Got you it. know, there are times where where curiosity was not the thing to be. It was like, you're being nosy, you know, because kids ask questions sometimes that you're like, ah, stop, don't answer, <laughs> don't yeah. ask the question. And they really don't have any judgment. It's really, they're curious. They have a question. It came into their mind, boom, and it they came out their mouth. Yeah, yeah they want to know. So most people can reactivate their curiosity, and it's going to look different in each person. Um what you don't want it to end up looking like is looking like time, you know, water torture on the forehead of your like interrogating someone. That's yeah, not it's like enough. it's like the first date that turns into an interview rather than like a getting to know you. <laughs> <laughs> They're not you're not actually curious. You're just on a fact finding mission. Right. Absolutely. And so I think a lot more of it is about observing and listening. And that is something that leaders sometimes can feel uncomfortable with, especially waiting for the other person to fill in that space. Gotcha. And yet they will. You just have to hold it for them. They're just used to maybe you talking, you, not you, but you, the leader, talking over someone or not really being interested in their perspective. So if, if that's where you started, you start, on the, I'm always right about everything and I tell people what to do and they do it to, hmm, okay, so we're going to do this differently going forward. People are going to test you. They're going to watch you. They're going to wait to see how you show up consistently. Um, and you have a few missteps along the way where you go, oops, <laughs> old behavior, got to come back to it. Again, it's looking at how do you have conversations? What are the words you're doing? What's your body language? All of those things come into play and do how you're creating an open environment or a closed down environment and then how people choose to then engage based on whether it feels safe or whether it feels like there's one answer (laughs) or it doesn't feel safe at all. Got it. So my final question for you, because I know we can wrap up and I would have you back a million times over. So thank (laughs) you for being on. But my final question kind of is, is, it goes from your la- the last thing that we were you know what we were just talking about in, in leadership and and how to be curious and and is it codified and can you unleash it in people and and this last question really your answer to it is and there's a lot of weight on you for this but you're either going to give me hope or, or you're going to crush my spirit so <laughs> the final question is this good to know the stakes <laughs> it, it it seems to me. And, and maybe I'm just a little jaded by this, and maybe it's because the work that I do, I do because I absolutely love it, and I am not exactly motivated by a desire to be the world's wealthiest man. I do this because I think the work that I do makes a difference, and I think that naturally makes me curious, and it naturally gives me a certain motivation. How, how do profit or, or um, you know, business growth and curiosity overlap. Are they at odds with one another? Because I feel to a certain extent that a lot of the things that we advise clients to do, some of it is a little bit of a leap of faith, but it, it's in the same principle as curiosity is an essential component of it. And to me, it would seem that you're going to run into, and I'm sure you do because I know you're working with really serious players, um, how does the profit-driven, results-driven bottom line, shave off you know, the, the, a few employees to increase efficiency. How do you get that person to believe in the idea of creativity? Because it would seem to me that profit as a motive and, and just in general greed and growth and, and the pull from Wall Street to report slightly higher quarterly earnings is at odds with creativity and, or curiosity. And Am I wrong or am I right? Can you please give me hope? (laughs) (laughs) Well, of course, I I, I will give you hope because I believe in that hope. I mean, part of why I do the work that I do is because I feel so strongly about 
you know, engaging people's hearts and minds and that that's really the differentiator. And if you think of like a Sir Richard Branson, he would sit here and tell you the same thing. And if anyone would like to argue with Sir Richard, go right ahead. Yeah, right. (laughs) You know, he knows a few Uh things about business. Yeah. So, you know, I think that one of the things that I found, I, so I was at, it was a couple weeks ago, I was at, um, HR tech world in Paris and, um, was part of the disruption zone. And so really the work that we're doing with Owen is about disruption. And it's made me think a lot about that. The other work that I do is also about disruption. It's about helping people, you know, change their behavior. What's the interruption? Um, so I, I would say that there's a, a mirror to technology when we talked about fear of technology, that sometimes people will let that get in their way. And even if it can do it more effectively, we have reservations, we might resist it. So I think even the how we work in organizations, we're still married to this industrial revolution, even though we've talked about knowledge work. And I think we're really going a step further. And what I'm seeing in out there is about relationships that relationships going to replace knowledge um, or and maybe adjunct to knowledge, <laughs> you know, that they go together. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that we're on this emerging edge. And because we're there, we're not going to see it everywhere. But what I heard when I was in that disrupt zone is I was talking to small companies, medium and large size companies that were going, we really want more innovation. Well, guess what? All of the of Wall Street and kind of how we have to have things in a certain way are some of the things that don't actually inspire that. So, and, and I'm not making trying to make Wall Street a bad thing. Oh, don't Wall worry, Street. I got that covered. I have okay. written, yeah, <laughs> well, I got that. So I'll be, I'll be there's the. Some, there's some big constraints that are created by how we're looking at making money and all of those things. I think that if you have people that can really commit to this and lock in on it, that you would actually see higher financial results. Um, But again, we tend to argue with what we think we know. Um, And the only example that's coming to mind that I can give you is that despite the fact that all the studies show that if you have more women on your board of directors and in your senior leadership, your performance as a company, your profitability is way higher. Well, isn't that a compelling enough reason for it to happen? And it's not. So we have a lot of systems that we need to disrupt. Mm-hmm. Um, well, there's actually think- a there's a venture capitalist. I forget his name, but he um, he's out in Silicon Valley, I believe, and he only invests in women led startups now um, because he saw that the return is just so much. Uh, above that of of male led startups that that's just his rule now. Yeah, well and I think that we again we need to do we need to work together and we need diversity and what's our diversity metric of our own network. Mm-hmm. Uh, asking people those questions because we get so complacent and so like this is what I do, this is who I see, this is who I hang out with. Well, that's counter to curiosity. That's counter to a bigger world. It's counter to an open world. Um, And so my challenge to everyone that's listening is to go try doing something that you haven't done before or do something you haven't done in a long time. Try being a beginner again. And for goodness sakes, have a few laughs while you're doing it. And then think about what kind of magic came out of that experience. And maybe you did it with somebody else, and there's that magic of that connecting with that other person. But that's my challenge is, you know, try to amp up that curiosity quotient in your life and see what happens. That is phenomenal, and I think that is a great point for us to end on. That challenge is issued by Miley, and it is (laughs) double echoed by me. Um, I want to thank you for coming on the show. Before we wrap this up, please tell people where they can go and be social with you and learn more about what you do. I'll be sure to put it in the show notes so it's nice and easy, Um, but tell people where they can go be social with you. Sure, and I wrote it down, and I'm like, where did I put it? Um, (laughs) So I'm on Twitter. I'm M. T-O-P-L-I-F-F on Twitter. I'm Miley, M-A-I-L-E, T-O-P-L-I-F-F on LinkedIn. And 
Miley Tepliff International on Facebook. You can also find me on Instagram and Pinterest, but we'll put those in the show notes. That's more of my um, personal development work, which is very much deeply connected to curiosity. Um, so that's where I have more of my creative side come out even more. So that's where I play. So right. look forward to that's connecting awesome. with the listeners. And Jeff, thank you again. This was so delightful. And it was just a privilege to be part of your podcast and your Equinox episode, no less. The Equinox episode. It's <laughs> awesome. Well, again, thank you for coming on. I just, you're just a delight. I just, I could do this all the time with you. So for out there, those out there listening, thank you again for tuning in. Come back again for our next episode where we'll have another brilliant person, another fantastic conversation. I am working my butt off to find amazing people like Miley to come on this show. So I hope you keep listening and uh, tune in. Take care, everyone. Thanks for listening. This has been Conversations, the True Voice Media Podcast. And if this is your first time listening, please do us a favor and drop by iTunes or Stitcher and give us a rating. Tell us what you love about the show and what we can do to improve the show. If you're not yet a subscriber, you can subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher, or you can be notified by email about new episodes. To subscribe, just drop by truevoicemedia.com slash conversations. Tune in next time where I bring on another incredible guest and have another interesting conversation. See you next time.